Hi, I'm Katherine Neal, and today we're going to be talking about the Martha Stewart case. You have likely heard of Martha Stewart. She is a well-known entrepreneur, U.S. business person, and celebrity in the U.S. She is well-known for her books, her television shows, and for her success in creating a, a business empire. A little background information about Martha Stewart. She was born in 1941 in New Jersey to a middle-class family. Uh, she was the second of six children. Her parents were um, immigrants from Poland. She was not raised in wealth or affluence. She um, was learned to to cook and sew from her mother and her father taught her how to garden and those skills um, came in handy later when Martha Stewart developed her business empire. Her first job comes as a surprise to many people. Uh, she first began working as a model at the young age of 13. She was a, a pretty successful model. She worked as a model all throughout high school and through college and did a lot of print advertising and television commercials. Stewart was a good student. She graduated with straight A's from Nutley High School. Not really too surprising. She seems like uh, someone who's very driven and ambitious. She graduated from Barnard College in Manhattan in New York City in 1962. Interestingly, she paid her own way through college by working as a model and as a waitress. She earned degrees in European and architectural history. In 1961, Martha married Andy Stewart, who had graduated from Yale Law School and was working as an attorney. Uh, the Stewarts later divorced, but Martha retained the Stewart last name. In 1965, the Stewarts had their only child, a daughter named Alexis, who achieved her own level of celebrity, not, not nearly as famous as her mother, but uh, Alexis Stewart has spent some time on the radio and has had a couple of television shows as well. Martha Stewart's first professional career outside of being a model was that of a licensed securities broker. She was a member of the New York Stock Exchange and had quite a successful career on Wall Street for five years. This information is relevant to the scandal that we're going to discuss in a few minutes. So keep this in mind that she was a securities broker. Um, her career on Wall Street ended when she and her husband moved to a suburban home in Connecticut. After the Stewarts moved to Connecticut, Martha became well known for her skills as a hostess. She began a catering business that was quite successful. It was called a catered affair and by the 1980s she had expanded her catering business uh, into a diversity of of business ventures she uh, branded the business martha stewart inc and she the business by the 80s included books uh, a retail store selling prepared foods and it included uh, the continuation of her catering business now, just to point out uh, her entrepreneurial spirit and success, when Martha Stewart began her business empire and, and created Martha Stewart Inc., um, these skills were not thought of as uh, big business, How, skills that would normally be associated with stay-at-home mothers, with housewives, as they were called at the time. Uh, now, today, we can turn on cable television and see the Food Network or the Cooking Channel or HGTV, and there's a variety of outlets for uh, the type of skills that 
Martha Stewart capitalized on when she built her business, cooking, creating recipes, crafting, decorating the home, gardening, landscaping. So she was uh, uh, at the forefront of what is now a, a large business segment. Martha Stewart in the 1980s also introduced a line of products at Kmart. So there were Martha Stewart branded items you could buy at Kmart exclusively. Things like bath towels, sheets, kitchen appliances, kitchen utensils, um, those types of things all branded with the Martha Stewart name. In 1990, Martha Stewart developed a new magazine called Martha Stewart Living, which still exists to this day. As her empire continued to grow, she rebranded from Martha Stewart Inc. and created a, a corporation called Martha Stewart Living Omnimedia Inc. to kind of encapsulate all of the different types of businesses that, and products that she was um, included in her business operations at that time. So the corporation included books, magazines, products, and syndicated television program. In 1999, Martha Stewart Living Omnimedia Inc. went public. So let's stop for a second and um, be reminded about what it means for a corporation to go public. Corporations um, exist in two different forms. One type of corporation is called a publicly traded corporation. The other is called a closely held or closed corporation. A publicly traded corporation is a corporation which the public can buy shares of stock of that corporation. Let's stop for a second and think about what it means to be a public corporation or a publicly traded corporation. A corporation by its very nature is a form of business organization that issues shares of stock. And stock, each share of stock represents an, an ownership portion of the corporation. And the corporation may issue one share of stock or it could issue millions of shares of stock. And if you own any of those shares, you are a fractional owner of the corporation. Now, there are two types of corporations, closely held corporations and publicly traded corporations. In closely held corporations, a limited number of people are able to own shares of stock of that corporation. I may not be allowed to own shares of stock of that corporation. You may not be allowed to own shares of stock of that corporation. It could be owned by certain family members or a limited number of people. And that could be even up into the thousands, but it, those shares of stock are not available for anyone to purchase through the, a stock exchange or over the counter. Their ownership opportunities are limited. As compared to a publicly traded corporation, which is a corporation that shares sells its shares of stock to the public. So I could go and buy shares of stock, you could go buy shares of stock. So why would a corporation decide to go public? And the event that triggers uh, becoming a public traded corporation is an IPO or an initial public offering. That's the first day when the investing public has an opportunity to buy shares of stock of a corporation when it becomes public. Now what are the advantages of being a publicly traded corporation as opposed to a closely held corporation? Um, well the biggest advantage is access to capital you can raise a lot of money by selling your stock to the public depending on how much investors are willing to pay for a share of stock of your corporation. 
um, as opposed to closely held corporations whose access to capital um, only exists in the amount of assets the owners have or the amount of um, money they are able to borrow from a variety of sources. So becoming a publicly traded corporation is of great advantage to raising capital. But along with uh, that advantage comes a lot of restrictions, a lot of disadvantages. You become, as a corporation, uh, subject to many, many more securities laws when you become a publicly traded corporation because the government has an interest in protecting the investing public. We'll talk more about that in a few minutes. So the day that Martha Stewart Living Omnimedia Inc. went public, Martha Stewart's personal wealth uh, increased dramatically because investors were willing to pay a lot more for the stock in the corporation than had been anticipated. Her interest in the corporation, the value of her interest in the corporation doubled in the opening minutes of the IPO. All right, so let's start talking about the facts of the scandal in which Martha Stewart was involved. In 2001, Martha Stewart bought shares of a corporation called M-Clone Systems, Inc. <clears throat> M-Clone was a pharmaceutical company. It was in no way connected to Martha Stewart Living Omnimedia, Inc. This is a completely separate corporation. Martha Stewart was not involved in this corporation in any way other than being a shareholder. <clears throat> Stewart's friend, her close friend, Dr. Sam Waxel, was the CEO and the majority shareholder of M-Clone Systems, Inc. And that's how she became familiar with the corporation and no doubt why she invested and bought a relatively small number of shares of the corporation she bought 5,000 shares. That did not make her a majority shareholder. It did not make her a major shareholder. She owned a very, very small amount of the outstanding shares of M-Clone. So this was a small investment in Martha Stewart's world. And she was a small investor in the corporation. At the time, M-Clone was developing an anti-cancer drug called Herbitux. This was their premier product that they were working on. It was really important to the corporation. And at the time that Martha Stewart invested in the corporation, they were awaiting FDA approval of Herbitux. They had already submitted all of their scientific evidence and they were awaiting FDA approval. In late 2001, there was some indication that the a FDA may not grant approval of Herbitux. And as you probably know, um, the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, must approve any prescription drug in the United States. While this news was important to all the shareholders of M-Clone, because, as I mentioned, Herbitux was their premier product being developed at that time. And if the FDA was not going to grant approval of the drug, that had serious implications for M-Clone. And their stock value would likely plummet when this news became um, public on the market. It's bad news for the company. So Waxel who was the majority shareholder of M-Clone, along with all other shareholders, including Martha Stewart, became anxious about their investments in the company, afraid that they would lose um, their some value of their investment in M-Clone stock. So in October of 2001, Bristol Myers Squibb, a much larger pharmaceutical company, made a tender offer for M-Clone shares. And during that tender offer, Martha Stewart was able to sell a thousand shares of M-Clone stock 
which left her with fewer than 4,000 shares after she um, sold the 1,000 shares to Bristol Myers Squibb. Um, if you're not familiar with a tender offer, it's simply an offer from, from someone, a corporation generally, saying we'll buy X number of shares at a set price during a set time frame and the first shareholders to take advantage of the tender offer can sell their shares at the price that the corporation offered. So Martha Stewart sold a thousand of her 5,000 shares leaving her with only 4,000 shares of M-Clone. In December 2001, corporate insiders at M-Clone became aware that the FDA was not going to approve Herbitox. That information was only known by a few insiders at MCLone. It was not publicly announced information. By December 26, 2001, and these dates are important, the executive team at MCLone was all but certain that the FDA was going to deny approval of Herbitox. The CEO, Sam Waxel, was Martha Stewart's friend, planned to announce this information to the public on Friday, December 28th. Before the information was announced, before it was made public, Sam Waxel began selling his shares and he tipped off his family members to sell their shares of m -Clone stock as well. Sam Waxel used a broker named Peter Bakanovic at Merrill Lynch. Now, Completely by coincidence, Bakanovic was also Martha Stewart's broker. So when members of the Waxel family began selling their M-Clone shares, Bakanovic said to his assistant, hey, we need to let Martha Stewart know what's going on. And, and a quote from what he said at the time was, oh my God, get Martha on the stone. So. Douglas Fanul, who was Peter Bakanovic's assistant, called Martha. Now, why do you think that Peter Bakanovic was concerned about informing Martha Stewart that the Waxels were all selling their shares of Imclone? My guess is that Martha Stewart, a very wealthy business person, was an important client of Peter Bakanovic's and he wanted to make her happy and he certainly didn't want her to be unhappy with him. So he wanted to let her know what was happening in one of the companies where she owned shares of stock. So here is a transcript of the telephone conversation between Martha Stewart and Douglas Fanul at Merrill Lynch on December 27, 2001. Martha answered the phone and said, Hi, this is Martha. And he said, Peter thought you'd like to act on the information that Sam is selling all his shares. She said, All of his shares? And Douglas Fanul said, What he does have here, he's trying to sell. And Martha Stewart said, I want to sell. Now, on his face, does this conversation seem problematic? Does it seem like she just violated federal securities laws? Or that Merrill Lynch just violated federal securities laws? Maybe not. Maybe it doesn't look all that serious, but it was. So based on the information she received in that phone call, Martha Stewart sold all of her m -clone shares at $58 a share for a total of $229,002 on December 27, 2001. The next day, December 28th, is when CEO Sam Waxel announced to the public that the FDA was denying approval of Herbitox. So they were not going to receive the FDA approval. That information was made public. If Martha Stewart had waited until December 28th, 2001 to sell her shares of M-Clone stock and the, the price of the the shares dropped based on the bad news that was announced as they expected it to happen. Um, she could have sold her shares for a total of $189,495. That's how much the shares dropped based on the bad news made public on December 28th. 
So she netted only an additional $39,507 by selling a day before the announcement of the bad news. Now to me, $39,507 is a lot of money. To Martha Stewart, based on her wealth at the time, this was not a significant amount of money. She was a billionaire at the time. This was a small amount of money in her world. So the net difference between selling before the information was made public and after the information was made public was really an insignificant amount in her world. Let's take the next few minutes to watch this interview with Sam Waxel on 60 Minutes. I always find it's helpful to... Let's take the next few minutes to watch this video of an interview with Sam Waxel on 60 Minutes. I always find it helpful to hear directly from the people involved and to hear their explanations of what happened. So let's watch Sam Waxel. Of all the white collar criminals who have been in the news over the past 18 months, none of them has received more attention than Dr. Sam Waxel. An immunologist turned entrepreneur, Waxel developed a promising cancer drug, engineered the biggest deal in the history of biotechnology, and then self-destructed in an insider trading scandal that also led to the indictment of one of his most famous friends, Martha Stewart. This past summer, Waxel became the first CEO convicted in what's become a white-collar crime wave, and the first to go to prison for seven long years. Tonight, he becomes the first to talk about his crimes in two long interviews that were conducted just before he went off to jail. How did you get into this mess? It certainly uh, uh, wasn't because I thought about it uh, uh, carefully ahead of time. I think uh, I was arrogant enough at the time to believe that I could uh, um, cut corners, um, not care about details that were going on, and not think about consequences. Two years ago, Sam Waxel was one of Wall Street's men of the moment. As the CEO of Inclone, he had just sold an interest in a new cancer drug called Herbitux to Bristol-Myers for $2 billion. Everyone expected the drug would soon be approved by the Food and Drug Administration. But three months later, Waxel learned from a Bristol-Myers executive that that wasn't going to happen. The FDA was refusing to consider the Herbitux application, not because the drug didn't work, that because the data was insufficient. New clinical trials would have to be conducted and the price of implone stock was going to plummet. What happened was that Sam Waxel did something very, very stupid. He told his daughter to sell her shares. Knowing that the price was about to go down. Thinking that the price was about to go down. Now, it's a matter of public record that you tried to sell some of your own shares. 79,000 shares. I had millions of shares at the time. And transferred those shares to Lisa, thinking that if she sold them, that was okay. I wasn't doing the selling. For 79,000 shares, that's about $5 million worth, right? That's correct. You're a corporate officer. I mean, you're supposed to know that you can't do that, right? Absolutely. Did you know that the SEC routinely checks the names of relatives and stock traders when there's a big drop? Do I know that uh, when I think about it? Absolutely. Um, did I think about it at the time? Obviously not. I just acted irresponsibly. You must have known you were caught, didn't you? No, on the contrary. Uh, uh, I was um, silly enough to believe that because it was such a de minimis amount of my holdings, um, and because I actually believed that we could rectify the the situation with the FDA very quickly. I didn't think I was going to get caught at all. At the time, Sam Waxel was a very wealthy man, at least on paper. He had made $60 million in the year 2000 and more than $70 million in 2001. But he led an extravagant lifestyle, and according to friends, 
felt a need to surround himself with powerful, successful people to be considered a player. His Soho townhouse was lavishly furnished with a collection of important modern art. And this is a Giacometti. It's beautiful. And his expenses approached a million dollars a month, much of it to service $50 million in debt he'd incurred buying him clone stock on margin. So when the price of the stock went down, so did his net worth. And he told us he had some short-term capital needs. When was the first time that you knew that you were in trouble? When the SEC sent notice that they wanted to interview me. And you met with them? And I eventually met them. And you were less than honest with them? I was. Another mistake. Another mistake. By early 2002, the government was investigating trades by Waxel, his father, his daughter, and one of his best friends, Martha Stewart, who sold 4,000 shares of Implone, worth $230,000, the day before the bad news broke. When you had the meeting, you said the people from the SEC and the Justice Department were there. Did they ask you about Martha? Yes. A lot? Yes. Did you get the sense that they really wanted Martha Stewart? Instead of me? No, I think they uh, liked that they had me, and I think that, that uh, uh, I got the sense that if they could have, uh, uh, if they could have Martha, they would be unbelievably happy campers. But Waxel made it clear to the federal government that he did not give Martha Stewart inside information. Whatever happened with Martha did not happen because she spoke to the CEO of Implant. Period. She never did. Therefore, I didn't give Martha Stewart insider information. Period. He's been one of your best friends. He's been one of your biggest backers, one of your biggest supporters, personally, closest Martha. friend. Martha called after she sold her shares to ask me what was going on at Implant. Stock was dropping that day. There were millions of shares being sold. The rumor was out there on the street. I didn't return Martha's call. With Martha Stewart's name attached to the scandal, Waxel found himself getting all the attention he once craved. You swear that only it was the wrong kind and at the worst possible time. On uh, the advice of counsel, I, I wish to assert my constitutional rights and respectfully decline to, uh, uh, to answer. The Justice Department called it the summer of fraud. I believe it. Enron and WorldCom had imploded. Millions of Americans had lost their life savings and were looking for blood. I was there. I was just right in front of uh, uh, their sites. And I was easy because mine wasn't complicated. There were accountants and billions of dollars involved. Real simple. What's been the worst day for you? The day I was arrested was a horrible day in my life. Did you commit insider trading? It is uh, uh, very difficult for someone who thinks about himself as someone who does good things for society to be led away uh, in handcuffs and uh, thought about as a common criminal. Did you believe you were innocent at that time? Did I know that I had uh, uh, committed an illegal act? Yeah, I knew. I tried to uh, rationalize beyond uh, uh, rationality that I hadn't, right? It was sort of uh, playing with uh, uh, linguistics, but I knew. And so did federal prosecutors. It was incredibly dumb, obviously, just trying to dump that much stock on the eve of an important decision. It was like running around in your underwear uh, in broad daylight. But U.S. Attorney James Comey says the insider trading was just the beginning of Waxel's problems. When his office began looking into other aspects of Waxel's professional and personal life, they came up with a whole raft of additional charges. There's that uh, great event in baseball they call the cycle. Right? You hit a single, a double, a triple, and a homer in the same game. There is no cycle in white-collar crime, but if there were, he'd have hit it. Besides insider trading, Waxel was charged with telling his father and his daughter to lie for him and directing an in-clone employee to destroy documents. He also forged the signature of a corporate officer to fraudulently obtain a bank loan. And he avoided more than a million dollars in New York State sales tax by shipping $15 million in artwork he bought to an in address in New Jersey. Everybody has flaws. Everybody. What are your flaws that led to this happening? 
I could sit there at the same time thinking that I was the most honest CEO that ever lived. And at the same time, I could glibly do something and rationalize it because I cut a corner, because I didn't think I was going to cut. And who cared? Look at me. I'm doing X. So what difference does it make that I do a couple of things uh, uh, that aren't exactly kosher? In fact, Sam Waxel had a long history of ethical lapses, reckless behavior, and embellishing the truth. He'd been dismissed from a number of academic and research positions for questionable conduct. One former colleague said, cutting corners for Sam was like substance abuse. He did it in every aspect of his life throughout his entire life. One of my great faults is I refuse to deal with the everyday details that people have to deal with to make sure mistakes aren't made. And I think in that way, there may have been an arrogance where I didn't have to deal with details, but these details were meant for other people, not for me. A certain carelessness, a dramatic carelessness. In the past, someone had always been there to give Waxel the benefit of the doubt, but this time, there was no one to save him from himself. He pled guilty to six out of 13 counts, but not those involving his father. What can you say about the negotiation process? There wasn't one. There wasn't one? No. Did the federal government use your daughter and use your father and use Martha Stewart to try and put pressure on you? I think that the federal government does anything it can to win its cases. And if I were a prosecutor, I probably would too. You know, I think Martha can take care of herself. But to use my daughter, even to intimate that they would charge her, because she tried to protect her dad, was irresponsible. It was just wrong. Why do it? What do you gain? Who are you deterring? What, my 80-year-old father, who was a you know, hero, who never did an illegal thing in his life? It just wasn't going to, I wasn't going to uh, uh, let that happen. You took the bullet, so to speak. If he has come to the view that he is protecting his father and his daughter, that's a noble thing. Uh, I wish he had thought of that before he sent them in to the SEC to lie for him, and then he took the Fifth Amendment, which I don't think is particularly noble. If he's come around to that view, that's a good thing from a human perspective. I don't disagree with uh, uh, the U.S. Attorney. It was not a noble situation at that time. We know what the infractions were from the indictment and what you pled guilty to. What were your sins? My sins were getting a daughter involved in something that she knew nothing about. That's a horrible thing for a father to do. That's a sin. <sighs> Putting my employee in a situation where the company that they work for and love was being mentioned in the same breath as Enron and WorldCom. And I look at that uh, uh, in many ways as a uh, uh, deplorable sin. You draw a distinction between what you did and what people at WorldCom and Enron did. Absolutely. I have a company where not one person has lost their job. Where no one's 401k has been hurt. So is it different than, than WorldCom and Enron? I think so. I wonder whether you're trying to rationalize some of this stuff. And it's, it's almost like you're saying, well, I violated the law for insider trading, I committed bank fraud, and I cheated on my sales tax. But don't call me a corporate crook. It's like, absolutely, I know I did something that was wrong. And I know that I would have, in another point in time, gone to court, and I doubt that the U.S. attorney, absent other situations, would have ever taken that case to court. This was done because the U.S. attorney was trying to make an example out of me. He says, look, I'm not like the people at Enron. I'm not like some of the other people that have caused the bubble to burst and millions of people to lose trillions of dollars in the stock market. What I did was personal. What I did was my own mistake. How do you respond to that? I think part of that's fair. I mean, he is not someone who caused the collapse of WorldCom, for example. But those people are going to get a lot more jail time than he got. You know, the folks who played guilty in the WorldCom case were looking at in the upper teens to 20 years of jail without parole. 
Sam Waxman says, what the federal government wanted and, and what you want was to be able to stand up there at the news conference after the sentencing and say, Sam Waxman is going to jail for seven years, and we are sending a message that this kind of behavior is not going to be tolerated. True? Part of it, yeah. That's the reason I exist, is for general deterrence. I can't catch every crook. White collar crooks look at the world, they read the paper, they watch TV, and what we're hoping is that they'll picture Sam Waxel as their hand is shaking to move a column of numbers from here to here. They'll think, do I want to go to the pokey for seven years? And they won't do it. And is it sunk in yet that you're going to have to go away for seven years? I don't think uh, uh, that it's really going to sink in uh, fully until the day I'm there and even afterwards. Are you despondent? No. How would you describe your feelings? I'm frightened. I am sad. I'm remorseful, and I wish I could turn the clock back and just change certain events at the end of December of 2001. What have you learned from all of this? Never break the law. Never lie to the U.S. government. If you've broken the law, don't talk to the U.S. government. But more importantly, I've learned not to be careless and not to be glib about things that you do because they can, uh, they can destroy all of the good in one fell swoop. And uh, I, I'm sorry that, that uh, these events had to take place for me to learn that. But um, at least I've learned it. Even in prison, Sam Waxel still has legal problems. His former company is suing him to recover a $7 million severance package, and he's named in more than two dozen shareholder lawsuits against Imclone. As for Herbitux, the cancer drug Waxel helped develop, recent clinical trials have confirmed the promising results of earlier studies, and the drug could be licensed by the FDA within the next few months. So let's talk about uh, the SEC and their role in the scandal um, with M. Clone and Martha Stewart. The SEC, or the Securities and Exchange Commission, is the federal administrative agency charged with creating and enforcing securities laws and in regulating the securities industry. Um, the SEC was created by the S Securities Exchange Act of 1934. The SEC.gov website uh, includes a variety of useful information about securities laws if you are ever in need and interested in checking that out. Part of the old laws in 1933 and 1934, known as the federal securities laws, the, the largest pieces of legislation ever passed in the U.S. to regulate securities, the sale of securities in the United States, um, require that investors receive financial and other significant information um, concerning securities being offered for sale to the public. These laws are in place to protect the investing public, to make sure that anyone who's going to invest in a corporation has access to accurate information about the corporation so that you can make an educated decision about whether or not you want to invest in the company. These laws also prohibit deceit, misrepresentations, and other fraud in the sale of securities. These laws also cover insider trading. Let's talk about insider trading. Insider trading may be perfectly legal. It simply means that someone who's defined legally as an insider, someone who works inside the corporation, um, who buys or sells stock of the corporation of which they are an insider. And that happens every day. Individuals who are legally defined as insiders 
own shares of stock of the corporation where they work, where they're an executive or a manager, and they may sell those shares. So that's perfectly legal. When we talk about illegal insider trading, we're talking about a practice where an insider trades shares of stock based on material non-public information that they possess that was obtained during the performance of the insider's duties at the corporation. So think about that. If you are inside of a corporation, you have access to information that other people don't have access to. And that could give you an advantage in deciding whether to buy or sell shares of stock at a particular time. What the insider trading law, law insider trading laws do is try to protect everyone else to to create a fair playing field in the market for those shares of stock. Um, so, what do the insider trading laws do for us? It keeps the insiders of a company who have access to information before the public does from having an unfair advantage. Insiders must wait until material non-public information is released to the public before they buy or sell shares of stock. The SEC enforces these laws and they regularly bring enforcement actions against insiders. So who's considered an insider? could be an employee, an officer, director of a corporation, anyone who has access to material non-public information that may affect the value of the corporation's stock. That's what the meaning of material is in this context, that the information may affect the value of the corporation's stock. In addition to insiders, there is other liability tied to insider trading laws. Uh, tipper and tippy liability. A tipper is an insider who gives a tip about non-public information to an outsider who may trade stock based on the non-public information. So that could be an employee who has access to non-public material information who calls their brother-in-law and says, hey, you might want to sell all your shares of ABC Corporation this week because something bad's about to happen, or you may want to buy shares of stock of ABC Corporation because something good's about to happen. In that case, the insider is also known as a tipper, and that is the legal term, and the brother-in-law who received the information is considered a tippy. That's the outsider who received the non-public information and who trades shares of stock based on that information. All of the people involved in that chain of information can be held liable under illegal insider trading laws. So back to our fact pattern in the case. After Martha Stewart sold her shares and netted an additional $39,500, she was questioned by federal agents who were investigating the Waxels' illegal insider trading. So my guess is that the SEC started looking at um, big trades by corporate executives at MCLone, most um, notably Sam Waxel's trades, uh, immediately preceding the announcement of bad news by the corporation and they look at the list of everyone who sold shares of stock immediately preceding the announcement of that bad news and they see of course Sam Waxel's name and some of his family members names and they also see Martha Stewart's name and they think wow you think that's the Martha Stewart and they brought her in to question her about her trade now, my guess is the initial questioning, they were thinking that she would be a witness against Sam Waxel. They were guessing that she received information, non-public material information from Sam Waxel prior to it being announced to the public, and that she made her trades based on that information that she received from Sam Waxel, and they wanted her to testify against him. That's probably why she was initially questioned. But uh, instead of being a cooperative witness and being forthcoming about what happened and why she traded, uh, Martha Stewart was uh, not cooperative. She um, 
got an attitude about why she was being questioned and on top of not being cooperative she started um, lying to the investigators she said that she did not sell her shares of stock because the Waxels were selling their shares of stock or because of the imminent bad news that was going to be announced about um, M-Clone and the failure to get FDA approval for Herbitux and instead that her shares were sold by her broker based on a uh, pre-existing stop loss agreement that she said she had signed long before the the sale of stock was made and investigators decided they were going to go after Martha Stewart to prove that she was lying that she was obstructing justice that she was not being a cooperative um, witness in the case and they proved that what she said was not true going so far as to ink test documents to prove that they weren't signed when Martha Stewart said they were signed in addition to questioning Martha Stewart they also questioned um, Peter Bakanovic and Douglas Fanuel from Merrill Lynch ultimately Douglas Fanuel admitted that he lied to federal agents and that he tried to cover up the reasons why Martha Stewart sold her stock. Um, at a news conference announcing the charges against Martha Stewart, uh, Jim Comey, whose name may sound familiar, who was at the time uh, a U.S. district, uh, uh, a U.S. attorney in the Southern District of New York, um, made the public statement that this criminal case is about lying, lying to the FBI, lying to the SEC lying to investors. Uh, addressing a question that had long hovered over the investigation, he added, Martha Stewart is being prosecuted not for who she is, but because of what she did. There were many questions at the time about whether Martha Stewart was being selectively prosecuted for her role in the M-Clone scandal because of her celebrity status. Because her trade was so small in the scheme of things. She was a, a small shareholder in M-Clone and her, her transaction amounted to a net gain of $39,000 which is a very small amount in the scheme of insider trading investigations. You know, they spent millions of dollars prosecuting her over a $39,000 trade. In March of 2004, Martha Stewart was found guilty in a federal courthouse in um, New York City. She was convicted of conspiracy, obstruction of an investigation, and making false statements to federal investigators. Interestingly, she was not convicted of illegal insider trading. Uh, Peter Bakanovic was convicted of the same charges as Martha Stewart was convicted of. Now, because of the uh, impact of being charged with crimes and being tried for felonies and being convicted of felonies, the price of Martha Stewart Living Omnimedia Inc. stock dropped dramatically when she was indicted, throughout her trial, and then when she was convicted. Even though her actions in the case and M-Clone as a corporation had nothing to do with Martha Stewart Living Omnimedia Inc. Those corporations were not connected in any way. Yet because her reputation was so closely tied to Martha Stewart Living Omnimedia Inc. and she is now a convicted felon, it impacted the value of shares of stock of Martha Stewart Living Omnimedia Inc. When the stock price dropped because of the, uh, the amount of shares she owned of her own corporation, Martha Stewart lost $30 million of personal wealth for every $1 Martha Stewart Living Omnimedia Inc. stock prices dropped. So as she watched the ticker and saw the value of the stock drop, she knew her personal wealth was uh, dropping dramatically. At the conclusion of her trial, Martha Stewart was sentenced to five months in federal prison and then after she was released from prison, she served five months of house arrest. When she was in prison, of course, the uh, the media and the public mocked her endlessly. Um, 
and there were all kinds of memes that you can find and jokes and cartoons that uh, talk about the the irony of Martha Stewart being in prison. And here's a short interview with Martha Stewart uh, talking about her experience of being in prison. with more of our revealing interview with Martha Stewart. Now, on Monday, we discussed her personal life, and, of course, we set her up with Match.com to find a date. This morning, we talked to Martha about her new book, Living the Good Long Life, and some of the ups and downs she's faced over the years. Martha Stewart came from modest beginnings, one of six children in suburban New Jersey. As a homemaker, she created a multi-million dollar empire based on her own image. But along with the highs, incredible lows, including prison time in 2004 for obstruction of justice and making false statements regarding her in-clone stock. After you reached mega success, you had a period where you watched it almost all come tumbling down. Well, I knew it would. I see, and that is also. You may have been more confident than a lot of other people. I was. I was very confident, and I and some of my friends who didn't have that confidence unfortunately missed out on the comeback so um when you know inside that you're good that you've done well and that you uh, are are an honest good person then you know that you can live through disaster i don't want to be i don't want to be defined by a moment in time that was a moment it's past i don't think about it anymore but i am but <laughs> i just got all excited last week I am going to start my autobiography, and that's going to be a good story. Well, how much? How many chapters will be related or, or dedicated to that difficult chapter in your life? Well, I think it'll be a big, fat, interesting chapter. Big, fat. I would think that if you spend time in prison, there's got to be time for self-reflection. What good came out of that time? It's hard to say good comes out of a bad time. Really? Yeah, and it's not, and that saying that uh, it only makes you better. Right. Oh my gosh! I mean, false, false. It's terrible. <laughs> but you didn't learn I lost anything a about. I did. I lost. Did you learn anything about yourself during that time? Did you learn that you're tougher than you thought you were? No, I'm a tough person to start. I've always been a tough person. Tough means I can survive. I'm a survivor. You're a magnet for praise. And sometimes criticism. Oh, it's uh, sort of equally. You think it's fifty-fifty? Oh, I think it's sometimes much worse, and it's and I don't understand it. I write books. I publish beautiful magazines. I've done television shows that are devoted to how Why do you think good people living. criticize you? Then? I don't know. I don't know. I'm just maybe because I'm confident. I think sometimes maybe I'm too confident. Maybe I should have failed, and maybe I should have just gone away and dug a hole and jumped in i you know who knows do you take the criticism to heart do you pay attention to the negativity not the unfair negativity no but while many criticize others can't seem to get enough of her currently stewart is in the middle of a legal battle between macy's and jc penny over the right to carry her products it's hard to discuss a case in the process right now we are in litigation so i don't really want to talk about it uh hopefully um it will turn out uh favorably and it is a contract case, Matt. So I think a lot of information will uh, finally uh, come to light that will put us in a more favorable light. Macy's, who currently sells the Martha Stewart brand, says they had an exclusive deal with her. Yet J.C. Penny and Stewart disagree. What drives you today? Uh, what keeps you going? Two new grandchildren. Is that really one of the driving forces oh, in gosh, your life? Oh, yes. I adore them. And uh, we just, I'm just writing, it's due, it's due soon, my article on making little dresses for girls out of old dish towels. I have a, <laughs> see? That's not true. It is true. That I ha, sounds like a Saturday Night Live Oh, uh, no, it's the cutest thing. And I collect old dish towels. These are, I know when I say old, I mean vintage dish towels. And anybody can make these dresses. What's your best piece of advice you were ever given, Martha? My dad was uh, said to me one day when I was maybe 12. He said, Martha, you are a bright young woman. You can do anything you set your mind to because you're 
a hard worker. Our conversation with Martha Stewart. So let's identify some of the ethical issues in this case. First one I want to talk about is taking unfair advantage, which describes illegal insider trading, you know, where certain individuals who have access to material non-public information take advantage of that, uh, where others do not have access to that information. Um, saying things that aren't true. In this case, Martha Stewart was found to have lied to federal investigators and, of course, violating rules. The legal issues in this case, illegal insider trading, obstruction of an investigation, conspiracy, and lying to federal investigators. And on the flip, flip side here, there were questions of selective enforcement and questions about whether Martha Stewart was prosecuted only because of her wealth and status. A stakeholder analysis of this case, uh, Martha Stewart, of course, was the most directly impacted and negatively impacted, along with her family and friends, also impacted from her involvement in this scandal. Merrill Lynch as an organization, along with Peter Bakanovic and Douglas Fanuel, were directly impacted. And beyond them, the clients of Merrill Lynch were negatively impacted and employees of Merrill Lynch were negatively impacted. M clone shareholders were impacted by this scandal. Shareholders of Martha Stewart Living Omnimedia Inc. were also impacted, as well as employees and business partners of the corporation and really any entity tied to Martha Stewart, to her name, to her reputation, all negatively impacted from her involvement in this scandal. So doing a quick ethical analysis of this case, um, what went wrong? What caused Martha Stewart to make um, bad decisions that landed her in the middle of a scandal in which she should have had no involvement. Uh, the first one, ethical egoism, where she was making self-interested decisions, even for a very small amount of money in her world, in considering the amount of wealth that she had at the time. She was making decisions that saved her just a little bit of extra money. Um, in a cost-benefit analysis of this situation, um, she was prosecuted, went to prison, and lost billions of dollars for a net gain of $39,507. So um, certainly in retrospect, it's easy to see where the decision to sell her stock before information was released to the public was an incredibly bad decision. And if we use the test of the Warren Buffett front page of the newspaper test, analyzing whether or not we should do something if it, that information were to land on the front page of the newspaper. Well, if Martha Stewart had thought about that prior to uh, selling her shares of stock, she certainly would have uh, reconsidered. Something else I want to point out here. Um, early on in this presentation, we talked about the fact that Martha Stewart was a stockbroker and worked on Wall Street for five years. She was familiar with insider trading laws. She knew what she was doing was wrong, um, which should have caused her to pause when she was asked whether or not she wanted to sell her shares of stock in December of 2001, but she didn't. So what went wrong here? Martha Stewart made a mistake. She exercised poor judgment and at least questionably violated securities law by selling her stock based on the receipt of non-public material information. Then she compounded the mistake by lying about it during her interviews with federal investigators. And those are the crimes for which she uh, ended up going to prison. And greed and hubris. Here, a wealthy person decided to be uncooperative in a federal investigation. She made a decision to sell stock um, based on non-public material information, even if it just amounted to a, a little bit of money for her. Um, and perhaps she acted um, as if she was too important 
to be honest and truthful when questioned by federal investigators. If she had been a cooperative witness, things might have gone quite differently for her. So recommendations. How, what are we supposed to learn from this case? How can we avoid making similar mistakes to those that Martha Stewart made in, um, in her involvement with the M-Clone scandal? Number one, know the laws and regulations to which you are subject. That's your responsibility to know the laws and they change regularly. So it is your professional responsibility to always know what, you're, what laws you're, you are supposed to be complying with. Uh, comply, comply with the laws and regulations even when it costs you money. If you make a mistake, admit it. Do not lie to law enforcement officials. A very important lesson to take from this case. And finally, recognize that celebrity comes with both advantages and disadvantages. Uh, the rest of the story here is that Martha Stewart served her prison time. She um, has survived far better than many executives who become convicted felons. Her life has gone on successfully. She's continued to write and publish books to be, be uh, to have successful television shows. So she survived far better than most people who get caught in large corporate scandals. And that's the Martha Stewart case.